Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's installment of Huron Pines Connecting to Nature series. We're really excited to spend the next 30 minutes learning with you. At Huron Pines, we work to conserve and enhance Northern Michigan's natural resources. Focused in three primary program areas, healthy water, protected places, and vibrant communities, our staff implement projects from river restoration and green infrastructure to protecting special places forever and controlling invasive species populations. If you're not familiar with our work, we encourage you to get to know us. I'm Emily Vogelsang, Huron Pines Environmental Education Coordinator. Jen Klim, a Huron Pines AmeriCorps member serving at Huron Pines, will be leading a great conversation today. And before we dive into that, I have just a couple of housekeeping items. Please make use of the chat box to respond to questions. You'll see them bolded on the slides or ask questions of your own today. We'll also be using the poll function today where you'll see a pop-up box on your screen that allows you to respond. Everyone will remain muted for the duration of the program. Your video was turned off when you entered. Please know that if you turn it on, all participants can see you. If you experience technical difficulties, Chris Engel, our communications associate, is available in the chat by email or phone. We'll also be recording this installment so you can watch it later. Today's content includes physical and mental health conversations. Please consult with your physician before you begin any new regimen. A big thanks to our healthcare partners in Otsego and Crawford counties who originally helped develop this content. As a staff, we are incredibly grateful to all of our community and frontline health professionals and are thinking of them during this time. And finally, I want to acknowledge the incredible funders who support the Huron Pines Education Program. The Great Lakes Fishery Trust, Consumers Energy Foundation, the US Forest Service, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities through the Healthy Watersheds Consortium Program, and individual donors and supporters like you. And with that, I'm going to let Jen introduce herself and then we will get going. Hi everyone, and thank you for a great introduction again, Emily. Um, I'm Jen Clem. So I'm serving with the Huron Pines AmeriCorps as a part of my VISTA service uh, through Michigan Tech, where I'm pursuing my master's degree in applied ecology. And I'm really looking forward to helping deliver some of the content that Huron Pines has been creating with you guys. Um, I'm also sorry if my video is not working or being a little wonky um, technology, I guess. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today about, so we're gonna go through um, how it actually looks when some of the health benefits for going out on walks and hikes, uh, how to prepare for those, how to properly stretch before and after, some observation and mindfulness tips, uh, including nature journaling, and some techniques that Huron Pines has developed that we're excited to share with you guys. And then finally, how to apply it in your own life and pull it all together. So, awesome. I'm excited about this one, Jen. And uh, thanks everyone in advance for bearing with us as we work through any tech issues. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, but as we're kind of thinking about going out for a walk or a hike, which really is just kind of semantics, it's a, a personal preference. I know some people define it as uh, whatever type of path they're walking on, whether it's a walk or whether it's a hike or how long it is, but um, so we'll just be using those interchangeably, but feel free to apply them to your own life as you want. Um, so just briefly to touch on some of the health benefits of just getting outdoors and walking and hiking. Um, they help improve circulation, helps you, um, helps your mood, helps with weight loss, increases your stamina, and all of these great things to get outside, especially when I think a lot of us are out of our usual routines and kind of stuck in one place and a little bit more sedentary than usual without even the walk to the car to commute or anything. So um, it's just good to keep those in mind when we're thinking about some reasons to get outside. So when we're thinking about actually going for a hike or a walk, how do we prepare for that? Well, no matter where you're going, it's always a good idea to make sure to decontaminate your shoes and gear, um, especially if you are going somewhere new or traveling uh, a distance to go uh, out walking or hiking, just because you don't want to be tagging along any invasives or anything that and bring them to a new area that they haven't been to. 
So it's especially useful. Um, most trails have boot brushes set up these days, uh, but it's pretty simple at home. Um, Huron Pines, I think, has some materials if you're interested in decontaminating and all that that we can share out with you. Always make sure to hydrate before, during, and after. So uh, that's key for keeping your body happy and healthy. And especially if you have a reusable water bottle that you can just take with you, fill up before, drink that, drink it during, and then fill it back up afterwards and top off your water supply. Uh, we're gonna get into stretching in a little bit, but really just making sure that your muscles are happy and prepared for the hike. I know I went on an extra long one on Saturday and did not stretch properly, and it is now Thursday, and I am still very sore. So <laughs> very much recommend stretching. And then if you're gonna be out for more than an hour, just kind of have a pack with a few basic essentials, like a first aid kit, maybe some snacks, your water bottle, and perhaps even a nature journal. Uh, with you. So kind of getting into the idea for how to properly stretch for one of these hikes or walks. Um, just as Emily mentioned, we are not healthcare professionals. I had one anatomy class in my undergrad. <laughs> and so um, in the take home notes that Chris is going to be sending out later to everyone who wants them, we're going to be um, actually sharing out links to partners and other resources that are healthcare professionals and have cultivated all of that. So we are just going to briefly <laughs> touch on this. Um, but yeah, so when you're out walking and hiking, it's important to know what muscle groups you're actually using. So primarily you're using the glutes, the hamstrings, quads, and your calves. So when you're thinking about stretching, you should really be focusing on those groups. So things like toe touches, leg swings, and then cat, simple calf stretches um, are great ways to just kind of get your muscles warmed up and in shape for your hike. And then core is never a bad thing to incorporate because that's what kind of keeps you upright and moving. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. And I think um, I, would, I could probably speak for most natural resource professionals at least and say that we're all probably pretty terrible about this before we go out and, and do our field work or our own personal recreating. Right, because you just want to get out there and you want to get out in nature and you're like, ugh, why do I have to stretch first? But it definitely, definitely helps in the long run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So once we're once we're ready, once we've we've got our materials of keeping us safe for our hike, and we've got our body ready, what's what's our next step, Jen? Well, how about getting our mind ready, right? And thinking about observation, which is kind of this ability to notice things, especially significant details around us. And so. As we're thinking about how to keep our mind sharp, we, we should be asking ourselves questions while we're out in nature too. Like, of course, if you're going out just to think about things and do all that, that's great too. But I think that it's always really beneficial to kind of get in touch with our surroundings. So how do you feel when you're out in nature, right? Like how, how do you feel as opposed to sitting in front of a computer at a desk? How, how do you feel in your body? How do you feel in your mind? Um, you can also be thinking about what season is it. So, of course, we know that on the calendar it says it's spring here in northern Michigan. But is it actually? Because I still see snow on the ground and woke up to a dusting of snow, right? So, um, what are some of those visual clues? Is there a certain smell in the air that tells you that it's spring? Is there um, a particular plant that you look for? Is there a bird that you're excited to see back, like Kirtland warblers, if you're out in a jack pine stand, for example? So thinking about that and thinking about these transition times wherever you're at, you know, if you're not in northern Michigan, what's it like maybe out west or wherever? And then what kind of path are you on? What are you even walking on? Is it is it a walk? Is it a hike? Are you on asphalt? Are you on a dirt track? Um, what? How many people have walked on it before you? So those are just kind of maybe a couple of key things to think about when you're on your hike and of course make up your own, look for things, but just to help keep your mind sharp as you're helping your body stay sharp. And so if you guys want to chat in, are there any specific things that you guys look for while out in nature? Like I'm always on the lookout for different cones from conifers and all of that I think. Emily, you have some things too. Yeah, I'm I'm always on the lookout for, there's a couple of trails I frequent pretty consistently. And so I'm always sort of just looking out for how it's constantly changing. I think that's one of the beautiful things about coming out of winter in Northern Michigan is that almost every day um, until we get several inches of snow on the ground, we can see things starting to emerge. Um, we see Patty saying that she looks for wildflowers that are in bloom. 
Uh, finding animal tracks in the snow, that's a great way to, to do observation. Um, looking for pine cones and looking for good sticks. I'm always down to find a good stick. Um, we've got some folks that do keep an eye out for invasive species, which tune in on the 30th for more on invasives. Uh, looking out for mushrooms, signs of bears and birds, so lots of wildlife, I think, gets people excited. And looking out for those chickadees that, that brighten our day, even through the long winters. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of different things that people are tuning in with, it sounds like, Jen. Great, that's awesome. That's awesome. And so um, I just have a couple of examples of things that I looked for right out on my hike um, this past Saturday. And so you can look for anything, right? I, I realize most of these are, all of these are plants or plant adjacent <laughs> things with the little lichen down in the bottom. But um, when you're out, maybe you look for your usual things, of course, and it sounds like everyone has great, great options, um, but maybe different colors and textures, right? Like we have staghorn sumac in the bottom left, and it has really fuzzy branches, which are really nice to just go and pet if you are missing a little <laughs> bit of physical contact. <laughs> or um, birch catkins, which really take on the light really beautifully, or all the different colors of lichens and if anyone is a lichenologist and wants to ID that lichen for me or any lichens, I would appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah, so or you know we're really using all of our senses when we're when we're out there, except for taste, I guess. <laughs> I avoid using right. taste at least. <laughs> well, unless you know what it is. Like a good wood wood sorrel is is really delightful. But um, yeah, cool. definitely do not taste anything you don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so some ways to document these things besides taking pictures. Um, nature journaling is one of the big ones, right? And not only is it kind of a good activity for keeping you mentally sharp, it can also be good for a couple of other things like tracking environmental changes over time, which you can submit to actual natural resource professionals so that they, like if there's a wetland nearby your house and you notice that certain birds are not coming to it as frequently or you know that every year the date keeps getting shifted out because you have it dated, you can actually submit that data and do citizen science and have that be a contribution effort to um, local authorities. And, and then it also helps you personally practice mindfulness. Even if no one else is ever going to see it, it can be a really good way to use those observation techniques and actually think about them and write them down. So, and because when we think about this too, environmental health is very, very much connected to personal health, right? Um, how yeah, our clean air and clean water and sort of how those are very interconnected for, for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, um, and that the act of mindfulness itself is just being consciously aware of something and using that to therapeutically kind of focus on the present for us. And so that's really, really important in, I think sometimes we can feel a little overwhelmed thinking about the future and thinking about how things are going to be, but sometimes we just need to ground ourselves. Mm -hmm. So have any of you guys actually ever used nature journals or practice mindfulness? I think we have a poll up. Yep, so you should all be seeing a poll and um, using lots of fun tools, all the tools we have at <laughs> our disposal right now. So uh, we'll give you guys a couple of seconds to, to click in and we'll share those results out. Um, yeah, I think, I think really when we think about mindfulness, um, you know, sort of both in times of, of health crisis and, and out of them, that it's, it's a great tool to just stay in tune. And for natural resource professionals, um, you're out and about, you're often out and about in places that we aren't out and about quite as much. And so it's a really helpful tool um, for, for resource professionals across the world. All righty. So it uh, looks like that we have a good chunk of you that are practicing mindfulness or both mindfulness and nature journaling um, before, which is awesome. We've got a couple of folks that have practiced neither before, so hopefully you're learning some, some tools this, uh, through this webinar. Yeah, and they're, they're both really great um, things to utilize, especially if you want to help get out in nature more and think about all of that. And so when you are recording in your nature journal, um, even if you don't plan on sharing it out with anyone, it, it can be really good for you to include these three things. Um, so your, your name or whoever's observing the, the phenomena around you, uh, the date and time so that you know when all of this was occurring, and then the actual location that you were at. 
because it might not seem like such a big deal for you, but if maybe someone, an archeologist, um, 200 years in the future found your nature journal, they could actually use that potentially to um, understand changes to the environment and the landscape around you. And so um, since my background's in anthropology, that always seems like such a cool idea to me. Yeah. Um, but it's also good, especially if you do ever think that you might want to share it with a natural resource professional, just to kind of keep that consistency. But whatever format you want to do that in, um, whatever is going to help you best is the best way to do that. So that could include drawings, that could include poetry, writing, like really the sky's the limit when it comes to nature journaling. Yeah. There's lots of different options and, um, and it's, uh, I think the most intimidating part for me around nature journaling was feeling like I had to do it in a really specific way because so often in, um, in my professional life, I've got to, we've got to do things just right. We have to record data in, in just a certain way and, um, implement restoration in really specific vetted ways. But, um, someone finally said, Emily, your nature journal is yours. Um, it, it might be helpful at some point if you have a long-term data, but it doesn't matter if you're a terrible drawer or not a very expressive person with your words, it still is, is a worthwhile activity to do. And, and practice makes perfect too, right? Like, <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, so as we're thinking about some of these techniques that we can use out either with our nature journals or just when you're out and about, um, there are three that Hiram Pines has really cultivated and I'm gonna let Emily take over and share those with you. Alrighty, so um, bear with us folks. We're gonna try something a little different this time and have you actually work through it with us. So what I'll do is I will explain um, each of these techniques one by one and then in very short 30 second to a minute bursts. Um, we hope that you'll practice along with us. Um, again, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, I will show you what I have done. Uh, you'll see that it's gonna be pretty rough. Uh, if you have an artistic uh, touch, these 30 second timing might be stressful and <laughs> hopefully it's not stressful. So um, we'll start with zoom in, zoom out. And the, the piece here is that it doesn't matter if you zoom in or zoom out first. I particularly like to zoom out first. So what I'm gonna do um, is I would stand about, uh, typically I like to stand five feet away from something I'm looking at. Um, so let's use, maybe I'm observing a nine bark bush, uh, which is a native shrub. Maybe I'm observing that and I'm gonna look at the nine bark bush and have that in my view scope, but I'm also looking at the broader context around it. Um, so what I would do is for about five minutes, I would journal about it. Uh, for me particularly, that means writing. Um, for, for Jen and for others um, who, have a nice drawing touch, they're probably going to draw the scene. So what we're going to do is for about 30 seconds, um, and I've got my phone ready for a timer, we're going to practice zooming out on this image that is displayed. So um, we will do that and then I'll share out and then we'll move on. Okay, so that wraps up our first 30 seconds on Zoom out. And so I will just show you guys. So like Jen said, I've got my date and my name and where I am and sort of what I'm looking at. And then I just briefly wrote down what I was seeing. And so you might have taken a second and started drawing the scene that you were seeing or, or taking pictures of it or whatever it might be. So that would be your Zoom out portion. Again, typically at least five minutes um, for how or however long you would like. So then our next step will be to zoom in. And so we're gonna zoom in on a particular point of this scene, which is a, a feather that we've seen on the ground with um, some, some other sort of uh, deciduous on the, on the ground. And so again, we're going to do the, do the same exact thing and maybe we're paying attention to a little finer level of detail here. So 30 seconds again, um, and then we'll, I'll show you what, what I did.
All righty. So on this one, um, and sorry, my handwriting is probably not super readable. Um, on this one, again, I, I used writing. You could have sketched the feather. Um, I did note that maybe this feather was about eight inches, um, including some of those measurements or approximations of size is a good way to sort of get that finer tune of detail in here. Um, I did note that I'm seeing acorn caps, so it's likely that some of the trees around are oaks. So, so sort of making those connections if you would like. Or again, if you're just sketching or counting the number of things, um, you've zoomed in on a finer detail. So that was the zoom in, zoom out. Again, you can, and I know people who zoom in first and then they zoom out. Either way, um, that zoom out allows us to get some context for which we're finding this feather or these acorn caps um, or whatever it is you focused on, maybe it was the moss. So that's zoom in, zoom out. Um, and then what we're gonna do next is what we call five minute listen. Um, and essentially all you're gonna do here is find a sit spot or a stand spot if that's more comfortable for you. And you're gonna just be still for five minutes, um, which for me is really helpful. Um, also is really great to do this with high schoolers and they, they love sitting still for five minutes and it's pretty cool what people will pick up on. So you'll sit still for five minutes and again, record what you're hearing. You can draw a sound map. You can take tallies of how many birds or frogs or whatever you're hearing. You can just, for five minutes, doodle while you're listening to nature. Again, it's all valid and all good. Um, so we'll practice that for 30 seconds with this nice YouTube video for sounds. Okay, so I wrote down things like I'm hearing chirping. Um, I am a terrible birder. Um, and so, you know, if you're a birder, you might write down how many different birds you were hearing in that scene. Um, I was debating and it's hard to tell. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm hearing the wind, but maybe I'm hearing the water. Either way, it's a really soothing sound for me. So I actually, in this kind of setting, tend to just start doodling as a way to, to sort of check out, but have my brain be occupied and, and not, um, not wonder too much. Um, so that's a five minute listen. Um, really useful if you are interested in learning how to help monitor for birds or amphibians. Um, it's a really great way because uh, we identify those sets of species largely by their sound um, when we're looking out to monitor for their habitat. So that's a five minute listen. Um, and then the last one we'll run through, uh, we call it a partner share. Um, you can do this by yourself though. So what you're gonna do, um, if you're doing this in a partner situation, you will find a smaller area. So we rec recommend a square foot or a square meter, um, but no, no larger than a, than a couple um, square feet. Uh, you don't want it to be too big because then you're definitely both gonna be looking at different things. Um, so what you would do is you each would be quiet for a couple of minutes. You would do your journaling individually and then you would share out. So the, what this offers is um, the ability to get to a different uh, perspective on what you're seeing. So if you're looking at this picture, um, which is from last May at our Hubbard Lake Preserve, um, somebody is gonna look at one thing and somebody is gonna look at another thing. Um, so we will do that for a few minutes, or for again, for 30 seconds real quick, and then I'll um, share out what, what I've done, uh, and then you can sort of say like, oh, I didn't notice that or, or whatever. So uh, we'll start those 30 seconds. Okay, so that was 30 seconds. Um, and again, I'm just writing down, and so I'll show you guys, but I'm just writing down. So what I focused in here on was I was just interested in how many different species I could sort of put my eyes on. And so I counted roughly six based on the leaves on the ground, the, the living things, the green things that I was seeing. Um, and so maybe you were 
sketching the fact that um, it's, it's early spring and so there still is a lot of brown in this image, but that our evergreens are, are still there or that it's a small scene on the ground. Maybe you focused in on, on ground creatures or if it was real life, maybe you focused in on the insects that were likely moving around in this. Um, so again, it's just a good way um, as is appropriate for, for social distancing and that um, is a way to, to spend time with somebody um, again, but still practice some mindfulness and, and be collecting some really good data. So those are just real quickly the sort of three that we utilize. Um, again, in the resource sheet that Chris will share out, um, we'll have the, those instructions uh, typed out fully for you guys. Yeah, those are really great, Emily. And it's funny that you focus on all the species. I was focusing on the fiddleheads and the pine tree, right? The little baby pine and probably the potential competition that would be going up um, <laughs> over time between those two organisms or three organisms, depending on how many ferns are actually there. So really great, really great way to talk to people. And so kind of thinking about how we can apply all of these things that we've talked about today. Right. Some of it's kind of obvious, like stretch before walks and hikes. Um, but, you know, even if you don't want to use a nature journal, even if, you know, that's too cumbersome or you just want to go for a little walk around the neighborhood, you can still be observing the natural world. You can still be practicing mindfulness. Um, and just, I always make it a goal to try and look for one cool thing on every walk or like find out one thing that I don't know. Even as I'm walking around my neighborhood and maybe some of the same paths I've walked a lot, like look for a really cool house or look for a really cool tree or, you know, um, anything that, that appeals to you, right? And since your nature journals can also be used as these data collection efforts, um, just always keep that in the back of your mind and um, we can try and help connect you if you are interested in doing that. We can try and figure out who, who would be the contact points for wherever you're at and try and help you get connected with that. So are there any of those techniques that you guys are really excited about um, using? I know the listen would be such a good one just to maybe like sit up against a tree and close your eyes and listen to the birds, especially now that they're all coming back. Yay! <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, we've got someone that says uh, that listening piece um, is, is something that they really like to do. Um, looking at the small landscape, so it sounds like mm -hmm. You know, the square foot or that um, zoom in, zoom out kind of approach is, is appealing. Um, I've, I really um, have been interested in sort of that partner share piece. Um, sounds like uh, Abby is also interested in that, that partner share piece. It's just a way to connect in a little bit different way. And um, honestly, right now, to just not talk about everything <laughs> going on in the world. So um, yeah. uh, revisiting the same sit spot and seeing how things change. So that seasonality that we were talking through in the beginning. Um, trying to zoom in, zoom out, and maybe doing it with uh, photos that you're taking of yourself. That's a great idea, Patty. Well, and too, um, if you did want to do the partnership, kind of like we just did, right? Um, you could do it as a Zoom meeting, or you could email it to someone or a bunch of friends and, and see what they see versus what you see. And really, you know, it doesn't have to be in person to be <laughs> applied. Right. right. So um, kind of the activity for this week is just getting outside. And if you do want to make your own nature journal, you can. Um, there are definitely really good recipes online, well, recipes, <laughs> um, uh, craft ideas online for how to do that. But you can really grab any old journal or paper from around your house, but you could decorate it, make it your own. You could um, pick up twigs and leaves and things that you find on your hikes and really make it a unique um, book. So just get out there this week and try it. Um, and how do your thoughts change during a hike? So when you first start a hike, how, how is it different than when you end a hike? And what are some things that you're noticing? And what are some of the big things? And what are some of the small things? And um, yeah, so just get outside and, and actually try and put some of this to use. Cool. Thanks, Jen. Um, I'm really excited to continue my nature journal mm -hmm. practice and hope y'all find it helpful in whatever way works for you. If you're looking for even more ways to get outside, be sure to check out the Stay Connected to Nature page at huronpines.org. And that wraps up today's content. Uh, we really appreciate everyone joining us today. I have just a few wrap-up items um, and do want to note that it's 1.30, so appreciate everyone joining us um, and we'll answer questions if anyone has them. As part of our efforts to understand if we, um, to how we can continue our education programming, we'd appreciate a couple minutes of your time to fill out the evaluation survey. 
Chris is putting a link of that in the chat box. We do have an overview document to highlight the primary information covered today, as well as several different uh, additional resources. Those are gonna be sent to everyone that pre-registered with Chris. If you didn't pre-register, shoot him an email, chris at huronpines.org, and he will get you that information. Join us next Thursday at one. Uh, we are talking ticks, um, all things ticks, and uh, Jen and I are really excited about uh, talking everything about these creatures because they're they're pretty fascinating. So if anyone has any questions, um, let us know. Uh, we do have a note that old books make great journals and sketchbooks. Thanks for sharing that, Samantha. Um, any questions from anyone? Doesn't look like we have any questions at this point. We really appreciate everyone joining us. Um, Jen and I can hang out for a couple minutes in case you do have a question. Yeah, and I just put up um, some of these quotes that I pulled from some of my favorite books, um, The Gospel of Nature by John Burroughs and Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, just as some things to get your brain turning and thinking about while you're out in nature. Um, so, from reading Sweetgrass, it's more of an actual mindfulness, like how does rain sound on different plants? And in the Gospel of Nature, um, just things to think about, kind of metaphors of life and mental health to actual running brooks. So, yeah, um, I love I really that love connection and reminder that we are sometimes feel separate from nature, but are very much a part of it. Um, we have Barbara is suggesting a book that is Anything by Bernd Heinrich, it sounds like. Um, thanks for sharing that, Barbara. We'll, we'll throw that in our resources. Sounds really interesting. Oh, not the name <laughs> of the book. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh, any, oh, anything, I see. Anything written uh, by <laughs> Bernd Heinrich. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good book title, though. I, yeah, I was like, oh, okay, sure. Like, I, especially in this kind of context of mindfulness right. and anything, and <laughs> observing nature, like, I am here for that. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, those, um, the take home sheets that we'll be sending out will have um, some more of that partner information and those techniques and just a, a, we didn't use too, too much vocabulary, I think, this week. Um, but some of that stuff and just quick notes on the talk so that you don't have to go through and like rewatch it to remember some of the main points. So. Cool. And just a reminder, we do really appreciate everyone filling out those evaluations. Um, and Jen and I will hang out another couple minutes. Um, but otherwise, we will uh, see you guys all next week at one o'clock. Yeah, and that's going to be some fun content, too. I'm going to be developing it with Shallon Gertler, who's um, another master's student at Michigan Tech, who does her research with iDNA, which is insect-derived DNA, and way, way, way beyond my realm. But <laughs> going to be a fun conversation, I think. Uh, we've got someone asking if they can forward the recording and share it. Yes, please do. Um, all of the resources, um, all of our recordings are going on that Stay Connected to Nature page in addition to activity cards and um, some really specific kid kind of friendly activities that we've developed. Um, feel free to share that broadly um, and more folks that can hear this information, uh, we're excited to share that with them. I think it's also on the Huron Pines YouTube page too which is, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, of course. We've got someone saying they're excited for the invasive species talk. We are too, uh, we'll be, that'll be our, our last one for April and we'll be uh, focusing in on forest invasive species and um, what, they, what they do and how, how we can remove them uh, as a sort of uh, regular landowner type kind of conversation. So um, thanks for sharing that, Laura. more demand for invasive species talk we are kind of talking about continuing webinars so if if you have any ideas or anything that you'd love for us to chat about or anyone um from here on heads to chat about we we'd love to give that feedback too so. yeah thanks for that reminder jen all righty it doesn't look like we have any more questions at this point um so we will call it a day and hope you guys um Get outside at some point in the next couple of days, um, even if it is in the snow, and we will see you on Thursday.